first Métis were children of indigenous women and European fur traders in the Red River area, now known as Manitoba. It dates back to as early as 1973 during the Alexander Mackenzie expedition. The Métis people developed their own language called Michif, which is a unique blend of French and the Cree language that is still used today. Roughly 33% of all Canada's Aboriginal population is Métis. Métis means mixed. The Métis Nation Blue Infinity Flag is the oldest continuous used flag in Canada and it represents the mixing of two cultures. Métis were often called flower beadwork people due to their combination of French floral embroidery mixed with Aboriginal porcupine quilt work. Métis are well known for their finger woven sash, which is referred to as l'assumption sash, and it is the most recognizable symbol of Métis heritage. A sash was often used as a belt, tow rope, tump line, or even as a sewing kit. They're made of wool. Louis Riel was a Canadian politician, a founder of the province of Manitoba, and a political leader of the Métis people. He led two resistance movements against the government of Canada and its first prime minister, John A. Macdonald. Riel sought to defend Métis rights and identity as the Northwest Territories came progressively under the Canadian sphere of influence. Louis Riel Day is on November 16th. The Métis Nation of British Columbia was founded in 1996 and is still going strong today. Okay, well, Darlene, thank you for participating in the uh, Northeast BC Métis Storytelling Project. Uh, we do this project with the goal to uh, tell stories from our elders and any knowledge keepers. And the idea is that we record these interviews and pass them along to our future generations and other Métis citizens so that they know a bit more about their culture and where they come from. Uh, so thank you for joining us. So. Let's start off with um, telling us about uh, your name. I know you as Darlene Campbell, but is that your married name? That's my married name. My maiden name is Desjardins. Okay. And tell us what do you know about uh, Desjardins, the last name itself. I was, I was adopted by my grandparents and their last name was Desjardins. So I took their name. Okay. And do you know any history behind that uh, last name? Uh, we come from... Way back when we did, when I did the archives, we come originally come from uh, Quebec. Okay. And apparently we were Iroquois before Cree. Yeah. So. And that's on your um, like with that maternal or uh, this is from paternal side. Uh, 1759 is when I I went back as far as 1759. Okay. So and upwards and then we moved up this way so but then that desert comes from your aunt who adopted my, you my grandfather your grandfather yes okay yes there was three brothers three desolates and they were all we were all born and raised around here raised here but not born here i was born in grand prairie alberta and desolate is the one that has culture in the metis side yeah. campbell has no relation no. to metis no okay so i can sure and uh, were you named after anyone? No. No? Okay. <laughs> and uh, do you have any nicknames? No. No? Okay. Not that I know. <laughs> <laughs> I only know he was Darlene and that's it. Uh, can we talk a little bit about your lineage, please? Uh, let's talk about, uh, let's start with your grandparents, since you were mentioning your grandpa. Yes. Did you? Well, my grandparents, they had nine children. And after they raised their children, then me and my brother, came along and they adopted both of us. They adopted four of us all together. And it was um, Loretta, my brother Jay, myself and Daryl Horseman. So yeah, so she raised four of us after she raised her nine kids. So what is it nine in total counting you guys or nine no, plus? Nine plus four. So 13 in total that she ended up raising. Wow, good for her. And um, your grandma, what was, do you know, what was her maiden name? Kellyo. Kellyo? She's from Kelly Lake. That's Métis as well? Yep, yep. Do you know anything about her history? Uh, yes, I do, yeah, quite a bit. Um, the, she originally came from uh, Kelly Lake, like I said. Yep. And they lived all in that area around Hibault and I just remember my grandma used to say all those little names and those little towns in Alberta. So, but 
um, when I was born, we were living in Sturgeon Lake. Well, by the time they adopted you, you were yeah. in Sturgeon Lake? Yes. Where's Sturgeon Lake again, if you don't Sturgeon mind? Sturgeon Lake is just um, about an hour and a half, two hours past uh, Grand Prairie. Okay, so in Alberta. In Alberta, yeah. Yeah. But that's a reserve. Okay. Yes. But, but we never lived in a reserve. We're not First Nations. We're Métis. That's right. Yeah. Um, so then, do you know anything about your parents' lineage then? Uh, I know your grandparents adopted you. Well, I, I knew my mother. She was like, she always, she lived this boat next door to us all my, all my life. So I knew my mother well, yes. Okay. Yeah, I knew my siblings. There was 12, 12 altogether my mother had. Yeah, so I think there's down to five of us now from 12. And everybody's passed on now, so. And what about that? Do you know if on your dad's side there was also Métis lineage? No, First Nation. Just First Nation. First Nation. Okay, gotcha. Okay, and then let's talk about uh, your siblings. You said you have a lot. Yeah, I do. Um, and they all live around here. They did. Uh, but like I said, some of them passed away. Yeah. You said out of 12, only five remain. Only five remain, yep. So, yeah. Um, okay, well, let's talk about your, your children and your grandchildren. How many children do you have? I have, three, I have three daughters and I had a son. My son passed away in um, 2015. Okay. And my three daughters now live in Vernon. That's where I'm trying to get to <laughs> eventually. And yeah, so. And they have kids of their own. They have kids. They have. They all. They have two. Two kids each. Oh. So a total of six grandchildren I have. Um, let's see. There's Matthew and Austin are the oldest one. They're both married now. And Carson and Regan, and then Bray, Braylon and Brindley. Then I have two great grandchildren, and the third one on the way. And that's Adley and Eli. Wow. That's really nice. Um, <clears throat> are there any other significant people, like close friends or neighbors, that you consider like family that are also Métis? Uh, I have a lot of, we call sister friends, like, because we were all raised around Chawan and, you know, we, we grew up together, like, you know, and yeah, we all went to school together and, and we still stay friends. And uh, so you came from Sturgeon Lake, right? Right. And then where, from Sturgeon Lake, where did you guys end up here in? In Chatwin. Yeah. Was it in Chatwin? In Chatwin. But uh, my grandparents used to manage, look after a sheep farm out at Hasler Flats. Okay. And that's where I started school, kindergarten. There was four families and there was 10 of us in one little school with one teacher from kindergarten to grade 10. What do you, what do you remember about going to school? We just, well, that I remembered there is, you know, and all the families still live here that we all went to school there. There was two of us in grade, in kindergarten. There was like one or two in grade one and it just went on and it went up to grade 10 with one teacher. Her name was Miss Burns. I still remember that. Wow. Yeah. She was a busy lady. Huh? Yeah. And do you have any um, like special memories about uh, about that time? Uh, well, I was only five, five, six years old at that time, but I do have a lot of memories. Yeah, we looked after a sheep farm where that was a lot of work. So helping my grandparents, me and my brother, you know, then. Of course, you got to walk to school, uphill, downhill, whatever you call it. But no, we didn't have to do that. But it was a long walk. But yeah, then we moved into town and and I started grade two in town here. Okay. And the school where the annex is right beside uh, where 7-Eleven is today. Okay. So the school annex is there. That's where I went to grade two. I had no idea there was a school there before. Mm -hmm. They were just annexes. And what was that like? What memories do you have of that? Um, it was good. I, 
I, I had a good school. Like, I was never bullied. I didn't find racism. Like, I, I didn't even know what racism was at that time anyway as a child, but I didn't feel I was ever bullied in school. Yeah, so. Um, do you recall any interesting stories about, I'm gonna have to back up a little bit because I forgot to uh, ask you here, one of them. Um, oh, any interesting stories about uh, when you were at the hospital uh, being born? No. no nothing, no. nothing special? No. And, uh, what in particular do you remember about your childhood memories? Um, just remembering how poor we were, but not realizing that we were poor. And I, you know, I tell everybody like we were poor, but I was never hungry. We were never hungry. We always had, you know, uh, uh, moose meat or bannock or macaroni or whatever the case may be. But I don't remember ever being hungry but we were very poor but yeah so and my grandfather um you know everybody used to go hunt and share their their harvest and my grandma always used to make tan hides and i used to go snare rabbits with my grandma and then we would have rabbit stew and i, I couldn't even look at it today <laughs> i'm sorry i just can't and I was raised, I was raised with that. That's what we ate. That's what you ate. Crazy. I know. I couldn't do it today though. And that was around here because I think you were telling me yeah. grandma and well your grandparents, they used to have uh, they used to squat right here behind the Legion. Yeah, Mogs and Flats. Mogs and Flats, that's yeah. right. And that's where like what while they were look when when they moved to Chatwin and while they were looking after the sheep farm, that's where you guys lived, right? No, we lived behind um, uh, where Tim Hortons is. There used to be another where we squatted also, but about 10, 10, 12 families again. From there, from that area, then we went to Moggs and Flats. But I don't remember the years. I'm thinking it's uh, early 1960s. Then we stayed in Moggs and Flats. And like I said, nobody owned their property there. We just all just went and squatted there and built our houses or no power, no running water, no nothing. So yeah, I know. I remember you and I were, were talking about that, but I didn't know there was a uh, two different. Uh, yeah, there was. Uh, yeah, there was. Um, and what do you remember about, I guess, the, the settlement at that time with the trap lines and how was the community? Um, well, well, my grandfather didn't really go trapping. We didn't do, I don't remember, recall him going trapping. I remember squirrels. I, I remember him skinning squirrels and go selling squirrels, you know, with the whatever. <laughs> but that was a long time ago. But uh, yeah, my grandma just, she made tan hides from the day that I remember her from the day I. And we and me and my brother Marceline, yes. And where would she get those hides from? Everybody used to come and give them to her. Yes, and me and my brother used to have to help her do, doing her hides. That is hard, hard work. And I would never, I don't want to do it again. <laughs> it's hard work. It's like you know because you got to stretch it, and there's so many steps you got to take to tan a hide. And then where would she? Like, would she give them back to the people that brought them to her and like sell them back to her, or they would just pay no, her? No, no, they would. Then people would order their mucklucks or bear hides or jackets. Or my grandma made everything. Like she sewed everything. She, yeah, yeah, right till the day she was, yeah, till she was eighty-six. Totally different world now. Yeah, I think I know one person that does that. No, yeah, she was a strong lady. Is, is that something that has been, do you think, passed on here in our community? Does anyone do that no, in this day? Yeah, they do. I think there's a couple in Moby Lake that's trying to keep it going, but nobody in my family, no. Nobody, no. What traditions do you, have you, uh, or did you keep that you currently still beating, practice? Beating. I, I used to do a lot of beating, but I do have arthritis in my hands now, on both my hands. 
but I can still do a little bit of eating. And when I have time, I try to eat. Yeah. Did you pass on any of that to your kids or did any other? No, yeah, but I'm thinking if we get to Vernon, if I ever get a chance to, because I'm never around my grandchildren. And, and when my kids were small, I worked all the time. Like, you know, I started working when I was in 1976 and I just retired here like two years ago. So. <clears throat> Hopefully you'll get to do it once you spend more time with them. Yeah. The grandchildren anyway now. Yeah, that's right. And uh, what language was spoken at home? Cree. Cree? Yeah. I was raised with my grandparents, so there was elders around all the time because my, my grandmother had five sisters and they all lived here. So everybody visited everybody. So yeah, and that's how I learned to speak uh, Cree is because I heard it. I, I hear it every day, right? So it's just like English, right? Like nobody taught me, you just pick it up. It's your language, right? And do you still speak it with your siblings that are still left? I do, um, but I'm the only one in my family that can speak fluently. They know basic. I, I know it fluently because just like I said, being raised by my grandparents. Is that something that, um, did your kids ever take interest in wanting to? No, well, no. Yeah, no, but I never had time to I never had anybody to talk Cree to, you know, and my husband's a, uh, a white guy, so he, I mean, he knows more Cree words than a lot of my siblings do, you know. My siblings are just basic. They just, you know, enough just to get by, but they, they can't speak it fluently. Gotcha. Okay, and um, now as far as all the kids go, like as far as your siblings go, were you the oldest, the youngest? Were you in the middle? I was, my brother was the oldest and I was the second oldest. Oh, wow. What was that like growing up? Was it difficult? Was it? No, no, it was not difficult, no. Did you have to, I guess, look after a lot of the younger ones then? No, because I was not raised with them. They were raised by my... Oh, but even like within the four? Because your grandparents adopted four, right? Yeah, but we were... Uh, Loretta was the oldest, and uh, Daryl is, uh, he has cerebral palsy, so he was in the wheelchair, and he still is. And my, and my grandma was his guardian, and then when my grandma passed on, then I'm now his guardian. And he lives in Creston, BC. I think we have a question here. Oh, did, at what point did you, uh, so you know, once you got a bit older, at what point did you have to start um, supporting your family. Do you remember? As, soon as, as I was old enough to go get a job, like I supported my, I was a single parent for 10 years before my, before I met my husband. So I worked all the time. So did you start working like while you were living with your grandparents? Yeah, I did. Yes. And what did you do? I worked at the high country inn for 24 years. Bartending, then I end up a manager at the last seven years. Wow. Yeah. And then, and then where did life take you? Then I went to work for Northern Health uh, at the hospital because I, and the reason I got my job is not because, because I don't ha I have grade ten education, and you know they needed a university and you need you know to become. To work for Northern Health, and I said I don't have any of that. I have grade ten, but I speak Cree fluently, and that's how I got it. That's how I got hired because I speak uh, my language. Then I translate for the doctors and the nurses to the elders or to the families that don't understand wow. what's going on. Yeah, that would have been, I guess, difficult when you have such sensitive information trying to be. Mm -hmm. And I work. And yeah, so my area was Chetwin, Dawson Creek, Tumbler Ridge, Hudson Hope, and Mobley Lake. And you did that for how many years? Just two years, because I hate driving. <laughs> I hate, so totally hate driving. So, and I had to be in Dawson Creek every Monday and Wednesday. Oh, wow. Yeah, for, for two years, yeah. So then I got a job offer for, from the Tanzan Friendship Center. Then I jumped ship. <laughs> and I worked at the Tanzan Friendship Center for 10 years, then I retired. And what did you do at Tansy? I was
as a financial uh, manager there. How did you like doing that? I loved it. Yeah. Do you recall any good memories from working there? Oh, yeah, yeah, we had a great team. Yeah, it was good working there. I love I loved my job there. What were some of the, I guess, more uh, memorable projects that you remember working on? Well, I was just strictly financial, right? So I was in the office by myself most of the time. So, but like we did a lot of programs, you know, we had the elders program, the youth program, like we had all kinds of programs, which is still ongoing to this day. That's very important for the community. Um, now tell us a little bit about um, your maybe, um, do you have any recipes, traditional recipes that you still cook to this? <laughs> no. no, no, just my bannock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, do you, before, so before you got married, do you recall any difficult times or any times of upheaval up in, in that moment in your life? No. No? No. Okay. Now let's get maybe into your life when you were, you got married. How old were you when you got married? I was 25. 25? Okay. And you got married to Daryl Campbell? Where did you meet him? At the high country and <laughs> he was my customer. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, so that's how we met. Uh, yeah, we got married in 1979, so that's how many years ago? 40 some years? 40, 42 years? I'm not sure. I don't know. Somewhere in the 40s. Wow. Now, and you said you were a single parent before you met Daryl. You had, was it just your boy at that time? No, I, I, and Sarah, yes. And my grandma was the one that helped me raise them. She looked, at, she looked after them while, while I went to work. So without my grandma, I would have never made it. And then you had three more with Daryl then? Two. Yeah. Yeah. We have three daughters and Barry. Got you. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's nice. And your your grandma helped out a lot then? Yeah, she did. Yeah, she did. She would look after them while you were at work? Yeah, all the time. Oh, that's very nice. So that's nice. Um, Tell us a little bit about uh, your um, involvement in the community. Now, like, you worked for all these organizations that ironically were also involved in the community, but I know you volunteer a lot of your time to the community. Yeah, I do. Uh, when my kids were small, I coached Little League right from they were sm of age to play Little League, and until they quit playing Little League, I coached for many years. I, I was a, a manager for my daughter, Tiffany played a ringette and then girls hockey, so I managed that. I was in the curling committee. Oh my gosh, I, I, I did a lot. I did a lot for the community, but that's who, I love to do that. So, and I'm still doing it today. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I was gonna ask you about next. So then how did you then become involved with the Métis Society here in Chetwin? Well, we, um, there was the three of us who were the founders of Mugs and Flats Métis Society, which was myself, Oscar McPeters, and Leanne McPeters. Oh, okay. And that's how we got the society going. And we were small. We did everything from home. Like, you know, we never had an office or any funding or anything. So we start from scratch. Then, you know, we do have a little bit now. So, um, yeah. So... I've been doing it for 21 years, so it's time to. 21 years, wow. And do Oscar um, and Leanne still help out every now and then, or are they? Uh, Leanne doesn't live here anymore, and Oscar does when he can, yep. Yep. Okay. Um, let's go on to maybe some elders along your life. Now, I know you said your grandma was pretty special uh, for you growing up. Uh, but were there any other elders in your life or anyone that had an impact on you? No, not really. Just the first sisters, I guess, just being around elders all the time. Just, yeah. So, no, not really. Uh, what was then your favorite thing then of spending time with your, with your grandma since that was your most impactful elder then? My most important. What was your favorite part about spending time with her? Oh, well, I've been with her from the day I was born, right, till 
I got married, you know. Yeah, she right. still lived with us after we got married, and she finally went to move in with uh, her her daughter, Mildred. And yeah, then she passed on in 1986. Okay. Um, I think uh, that was basically, you thankfully you answered a lot of these for me, so that was nice. Uh, but the one thing I, I always, um, the two questions we always end on are, uh, one is, uh, can you tell us a, a little bit about the role of spirituality in your life, if, if any, that, that, that plays in your life? Um, my grandmother was a big uh, Catholic. She was, a, we had to go to church all the time. Like my grandma was big with the Catholic church. And when, and when we were in elementary, when the school was out in June, then we had to go to catechism. So we never even really ever got a break. So we went to uh, Father Youngblood's church for catechism. And yeah, it was just something we just had to do. So, and not just me, it was just every, everybody around us. And is that something that has stayed with you to this day? Yeah, yeah. You know, I used to go to church quite a bit, but I don't anymore. I but maybe one day when I move and have a little bit more freedom, I can go back to it. So, yeah. And what about your your kids or in your family? No, none of them go to church. Yes, my uh, grandson, his wife, and their family go to church every Sunday to this day. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you then were to pass on anything to anybody watching this, maybe down the road in the future. Any message that you want to pass on to future generations? What would you want to say to them about the Métis culture? Oh, man. Never give up. Follow your dream. Why never give up, specifically? I'm curious. <laughs> well, because a lot of, lot of people do give up. You know, they give up their education. They give up their children. They... You know, sometimes it's a hard life, you know. I've never done drugs in my life. I've never smoked a cigarette in my life, you know. I didn't have those, you know, to hold me back from anything. So, but now it's, there's so much drugs and, you know, it's so bad out there now today. Like, thank goodness none of my children are involved in that or and I have three great son-in-laws are my best friends. <laughs> so that's a bonus. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, it's a nice message. Well, thank you again for being part of the uh, Northeast BC Métis Storytelling Project. And uh, we appreciate the stories that you told us. You're welcome.